Let's talk about common and special orbits. Common orbits are essentially sets of orbits where any one of the six, so any of the six classical elements are kept constant. It could be the altitude. Actually, that's not a classical element, but it could be altitude, it could be eccentricity, it could be inclination, what have you. Special orbits are essentially uh, unique variations from within these sets. Uh, the distinction will become clearer when we talk about that, so let's do it. The easiest set of um, common orbits is that determined by the central body. If, for example, this is the central body and this is the orbit around that, if this central body is the Earth, then this orbit would be known as a geocentric orbit. The word has two parts, a prefix and a suffix. Geo is the demonym, demonym for the Earth, whereas centric simply means the central body around which the orbit is. If the body were the Sun, the prefix would change to helio. So one would say it's a heliocentric orbit. I'll give you more examples. If the central body were the Moon, it would be called a lunar orbit to keep things simple. Rarely, if ever, you will hear the term selenocentric orbits. If the body were to be Mars, it would be known as an areocentric orbit, but most commonly these days you would simply hear a Mars-centric orbit, and so on and so forth. So the central body is the one of the classifications, one of the sets of orbits. As you can tell, all satellites that orbit the Earth are geocentric satellites, including the Moon, which is also a natural satellite of the Earth. The next classification can be by altitude. Um, suppose this is the surface of the Earth. The first band of classification by altitude, by orbital altitude, is one that goes up to uh, 2,000 kilometers above mean sea level. So supposing that this here is mean sea level and this here is 2000 kilometers high this would be a set of orbits known as low earth orbit or low earth orbits the international space station is within this band and it is at an altitude of roughly 340 kilometers the hubble space telescope is also within this band and it um, orbits the Earth at roughly 500 or so kilometers above mean sea level. The next band would be proceeding outwards from 2,000 kilometers to roughly a point that for now will seem arbitrary when I write this number down. It's 35,786 kilometers and anywhere in this band if a, if a satellite exists anywhere within this band, it, it is known, it is called to be in a medium Earth orbit. Now, why this number? Because when a satellite orbits at this altitude above mean sea level, in a circular orbit, um, its orbital period, that is the time that it takes to complete one complete revolution around the Earth, is almost exactly equal to one sidereal day. That word is pronounced sidereal, not sidereal. And one sidereal day is equal to 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4 seconds. That is the rotation period of the Earth. So a satellite at that point will rotate with the Earth and will remain stationary to an observer um, directly below the satellite. They'll come to that in a moment. That is an interesting uh, group of satellites in itself. Above the medium Earth orbits lies the high Earth orbit band and 
this can go anywhere from 35 786 kilometers to beyond um, approaching the moon beyond the moon as long as it is orbiting the earth beyond this altitude it is known to be in a high earth orbit the Apollo spacecraft which uh, were put into a parking orbit um, after launching from the earth were roughly around this this bracket here somewhere between 1800 to 2000 kilometers ish so they were sort of in between Leo and MEO um, it's only only Leo by the way is known as Leo uh, we don't pronounce this as Mio and Hio they are simply known as MEO and HEO the space shuttle uh, is able to reach the ISS therefore it can it can get to the altitude of 340 kilometers but uh, but the Hubble Space Telescope um, is about the maximum altitude that is that the shuttle is or was capable of um, the next classification is by direction and this is an interesting one and let's see let's see why that is an interesting one because for example if this here is the earth and I'm going to draw the equator and the north-south axis and I'm going to draw another earth over here with the same thing uh, the equator and the north-south axis what I'm going to do here is I'm going to suppose that this here is Cape Canaveral uh, in Florida so from Cape Canaveral satellites and most actually all launchers usually launch uh, always launch in the east toward the east uh, this this goes of course with the rotation of the earth the earth rotates from west to east and because it is with the rotation of the earth the orbit that it will be placed in will be known as a posi grade orbit also known sometimes as a uh, pro grade orbit posi and pro both mean with the rotation of the earth now suppose on the right hand side of this point here is uh, let's say Vandenberg Air Force Base on the western coast of the United States from Vandenberg launchers can only launch westward because east would be the United States and one can't launch like that uh, if launchers launch over the Pacific Ocean westward they are going against the rotation of the earth which is again the same from west to east and in this case uh, these orbits are, are the satellites that are placed in these orbits are essentially placed in retro grade orbits retrograde meaning going against the rotation of the earth so the question here would be why do we bother putting satellites in either pro or retrograde orbits how does it matter whether we launch east or west well first of all it would matter if there would there is land directly in front or in the path of the launcher immediately after launching you don't um, for example if I were to draw Florida roughly on this side if uh, that's Florida and that's Cape Canaveral right there launching westward from Florida would mean launching right over land so if a catastrophe or an accident were to happen it would happen over populated areas and that is of course not acceptable launching east however is okay because here's the Atlantic Ocean similarly for uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base this being the western coast of the United States from Vandenberg one cannot launch just like from Florida one cannot launch west from Vandenberg one cannot launch east because of course you'll be flying right over the United States so from Vandenberg one can only launch west or directly south but that is another special case of orbits which we will see um, right after this actually why do we launch posi grade orbits because the rotation of the earth is in the same direction as the orbit while the launcher is standing steady and rotating on the surface the earth's surface is actually moving at 360 degrees every 24 hours uh, roughly which is about 15 degrees per hour give or take so at Cape Canaveral and as you go closer to the equator you already have in your to your launcher the Earth's orbital velocity as an added bonus you don't have to account for that 
orbital velocity. Um, retrograde orbits have that difficulty in the sense that the Earth is still going at 15 degrees per hour, but now the retrograde orbits must account for the fact that there, is, there will be an orbital velocity loss once they launch, so they must launch with that extra energy, so that's the downside for retrograde orbits. Uh, the good thing about retrograde orbits is because the Earth is moving in the opposite direction, retrograde orbits will travel quicker in their orbit. Obviously because if you have, let's say, I'm going to draw the surface of the Earth in a map, and this is the equator in the middle, and this is Cape Canaveral. If I launch east, the orbital track will be something like this, and the Earth is moving in this direction, and let's say that is actually the velocity of the Earth, and this is the velocity of the satellite, then what's going to happen is that there's that difference uh, which the Earth will slowly eat away, and at one point the orbit will again cross Cape Canaveral at the same exact location. Um, if you're launching westward from, say, now this is Vandenberg, uh, if this is the velocity of the uh, of the orbit, of speed of the orbit, satellite in the orbit, and this is the direction of the Earth, or the velocity of the Earth's rotation, then what you have is that they're moving away essentially at that speed. So it's that plus that. So the object will appear over Cape Canaveral much quicker than one launched posigrade. So if you want an, a satellite to come over the surface over the same spot quicker than you normally would have, you would launch in retrograde orbits. Uh, today, most Earth observation satellites, infrared satellites, are launched in retrograde orbits. You don't want to launch in retrograde orbits for communication satellites simply because of the energy penalty, which could be huge in terms of both money and fuel and weight or mass. So most communication satellites are launched in the positive grade. So that's a bit of a uh, a bit of a tangent in in the in, in that direction, literally. Now we can go on to the next classification, which is based on the inclination or the tilt of the orbit. Uh, suppose again this is the Earth and I'm going to draw the equator of the Earth again here and this is a north-south pole axis this being the North Pole. Uh, suppose I'm drawing an orbit at some inclination, some arbitrary inclination here. Uh, if this is the plane of the orbit there then we have that angle with the equator of the Earth which is of course the inclination angle. If the inclination angle is zero, the plane of the orbit will coincide with the equatorial plane and that orbit will be known as an equatorial orbit. Equatorial orbit. If I increase the angle from zero, it would definitely be an inclined orbit. Inclined orbit. If I keep increasing the angle of the orbit all the way so it's 90 degrees, then the orbit would be coincident with the north-south um, axis. And that is in a special case of orbits known as polar orbits. Now why do we use polar orbits? The reason is if you want to uh, observe the poles rapidly and consistently, any inclination will only carry you so far at some latitude even an orbit, for example, this, if this is the Earth and if this is a geosynchronous or a geostationary satellite far away, at, in fact about 35,786 kilometers from the surface of the Earth, even at that distance it can only be viewed by people below or above 81 degrees latitude. So <laughs> communications above that latitude are impossible with uh, geostationary satellites because they will always be below the horizon for anyone living above or below that latitude so that's where you use polar orbits. Another uh, special case of orbits that you can also use to communicate with people living above um, or anything above 81 degrees is a special case of orbits known as tundra orbits whose inclination is approximately 84 and a half degrees. Now notice what happens here, an interesting phenomenon takes place in that if I were to increase the inclination to 90 degrees and go beyond 90 degrees, 
I have basically turned this orbit from going like that to like that. That is a polar orbit. And then I've actually increased it to beyond the polar orbit. But look what's happening here. This object is now going in this direction. Previously, it was going with the spin of the Earth. Now, clearly, it's going against the spin of the Earth. So, if I keep increasing the inclination angle, what will what I have what I will have done is I have essentially turned a posigrade or a prograde orbit into a retrograde orbit. Uh, this is not how we change uh, satellites. Rarely, if ever, uh, change their inclination angle by that much because it's it's very expensive in terms of fuel and maneuvers um, and also th there's a simpler way to do it in that just just launch the satellite in a retrograde orbit to begin with so that is uh, inclination is the fourth um, category of common orbits the fifth is uh, the fifth depends before we go to special orbits actually the uh, fifth depends on eccentricity eccentricity we know that, uh, for example, let's say this is the central body and that's one of the foci and this is the second foci, then if this is an elliptical orbit, the eccentricity of that orbit depends on the um, radius of the perigee or the periapsis as well as the radius of the apoapsis, uh, which also means it depends directly on the uh, ma major or the semi-major axis A. Um, now, if I were to bring the two focal points closer and closer together, at one point they will coincide, and what will happen is that the orbit will lose its eccentricity in that it will be zero. And that is a special case of orbits known as circular orbits. If, on the other hand, I push the two uh, focal points or the foci further and further, to a vast distance, what's going to happen is that orbit is simply going to slingshot itself away from whatever the central body is, simply because the velocity at this point, the uh, periapsis velocity will be greater than the escape velocity of that central body, and this is this is hap this happens when the eccentricity is approximately one or approaching one, uh, and this is called an escape orbit escape orbit. Anything between those two, uh, circular and escape, obviously you will have some sort of an elliptical orbit. Elliptical orbits always have ex eccentricity from 0 to 1, not including 1, they may include 0. Um, 